And the next full task force meeting is coming up on Wednesday, January 19th. So we have a lot of activity this month in particular. Um, we are all working towards the final report that will be due 12 months after the first meeting, which was on November 17th. And that will, I'm sorry, which was in November of 2021. So this final report is will be presented on November 17th, 2022. Um, what will be accomplished for that report will be there has to be an action plan and it will um, address the nine categories that have been established by the uh, task force. Um, after that November 2022 meeting, um, this task force can meet will meet annually. Um, and they will meet annually to track track the progress on the action plan that's being um, worked on and established now. And they'll also discuss budgeting um, items for action plan priorities. Um, currently, we are here in the schedule of our annual um, task force convening. And um, we, like I said, we do have quite a few um, activities for this month. We'll have a governance meeting and a full task force this meeting this month as well. Um, so the goals for today's meeting is um, to discuss what we are calling the benefit effort matrix and action plan. Um, this action plan um, exercise will um, basically look at every category, identify rough level mm -hmm. of um, a rough level of impact, effort, and time, and then we will also include additional projects not currently identified, and hopefully that will come out of the conversation from each of the uh, task force members as we work through the items um, that we will discuss today. We also hope to prepare a report to prepare to report action team progress um, at the January full task force meeting. So whatever we discuss today will be summarized and reported out at that full task force meeting. Next slide, please. So again, we have two action teams and nine categories. The first, um, the first categories one through four um, is, is handled by or spoken to by the residential resilience um, action team. And then we have a governance and coordination action team that handles items five through nine. Thank you. Next slide, please. So for today's discussion, we are going to hear a lot from Salil Kakar, who is with DC Water, and he will lead um, this next, the next 60 to 70 minutes of conversation. Thank you, Salil. Thank you, Monty. And good afternoon and a happy new year. And hopefully I'll do more leading and less talking and let the team do a lot of the talking uh, as we move forward this afternoon. Next slide, please. So I want to start with this slide because we always start with the end in mind. Uh, we've got a lot of ideas and there's more develop, being developed as we move along. And we need to have a way to categorize the ideas so that we know uh, what's the effort, what is the benefit of these ideas. So it's typically a, a value effort matrix that's shown up here and there's four quadrants. I'm sure you're familiar with it and uh, pardon the redundancy if I go through it. Um, and we'll be happy to send you copies of this so there you know, It's uh, the bottom left is what we call a quick win, quick win. Those are easy to implement, may have a low value, but they do have a value, but they're very quick to implement. Um, this is something we can do right away and we should proceed with it. Um, this is a short timeline, fast acting ideas that we can implement. Going up to the top left, these are ideas that have a very high benefit um, and need some level of commitment from the team, but it's manageable commitment. But the benefit is tremendously high. And the fact that the effort required is low means they can be implemented quickly. Top right, what we call the big bets, those are large projects with tremendous return, very high benefit. Also, probably involve a lot of agencies and a combined effort. Doesn't mean we don't do it. It just means it gets done on a different timeline. But in the bottom right, the spinning wheels, these are projects that take a lot of effort, but in the end, when you step back and look at it, the benefit it derives is not in proportion to the amount of effort required. And those need to be looked at seriously. 
Um, it's not that you don't do it, but since we all have to prioritize our time and any available funds, you have to say where do you want to apply that time and funds. So these are the four groupings we want to put projects into. Not just the ones we talk about today, but as we go along, anything new that comes along, we need to have a method of coming together and saying, all right, which box does it belong in? And the next couple of slides, next we're gonna explain how do we put them in one of these boxes? Thank you very much. So from the value effort, the effort perspective, let's start from there, effort to execute the work. Um, we took a quick look at this and we'd love to get your input in on here. Um, let's say in the effort, if it's a single agency effort that can implement it, uh, for example, if it's a backwater valve, I'm just using an example, it would go into the low category because it's a single agency. If it requires more than one agency to work on it, so two agencies, it's a medium level of effort. And if something requires coalition building, because there's multiple agencies, NGOs, other entities that need to be part of the discussion, that's fine. But we just put it in the high effort requirement. Same thing goes with time to complete. If it can be done within a year, it's one, one to five year window, medium, and projects that go beyond five years are under high. Cost range, same thing on a million, a million ten, or at over ten million. And, and the reason we want to go through this is as we go through the projects, and um, we, we use the straw man in terms of assigning these values, low, medium, or high, and we'd like the team to look at it and agree or recommend an alternate. On the benefit side, if it's citywide. It's a large benefit. If you completely remove a flood risk, it's a tremendous benefit. Medium, it's 100 to 500 year floodplain area, or if you substantially reduce the flood risk. And low would be if it's an individual home or a very specific area and a small reduction in flood risk. They're all good. None of this is bad. It just means how do we categorize the projects so that we know where to put our energies. Next slide. I will go into these in detail just to give you an idea on what the matrix would look like. It's color coded so that visually you can quickly tell where something falls. Uh, so this is category one, flood and sewer line backup insurance. And Philip, uh, we just took a quick crack at this. We'd love for you to jump in here and guide us through it in some of the discussion items later on. But for example, let's take action 1.2.1, negotiated fixed scope of drying cleanup services. Is the effort easy, time easy? It's gonna cost money. And what's the benefit? Benefits a lot of people. Okay, so just going through and the ask for today is for us as a team to go through these four categories, lists of projects, and say yay, nay, or propose an alternate for effort, time, cost, and benefit. I'm gonna stop here, and before we actually go into the projects, ask if there's any questions. Just a thought, if I may. Yes, please. Um, if you go back to the flood of September 2020. Yes, sir. Is there enough data on how people were actually impacted to take this list of action ideas and overlay it on the actual experience and see, you know, how it might have been different if one of these actions were in place or how many people would have benefited fitted from, you know, one action versus another looking back. Is that possible? It's certainly possible to do that. We have a lot of data from the September 2020. We have the calls that came in. We have the 
insurance claims that came in. We have the back order valve request that came in. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe others wouldn't see any benefit in it. I just wonder what we could learn by doing that. You know, by overlaying this on the actual experience in the flood and seeing how it might have made a difference. Just a thought. No, I love the thought, and 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 here's why I like it. Anything that we do, we need to be able to measure its effectiveness. And an exercise like the one you propose, um, it may not be perfect, but it's still a method of measuring. Because in the end, uh, these are proposed actions, there's proposed benefits. And once these are done, we want to ensure that there is a tangible uh, validation of the what we had assumed. So yes, a great idea. Thank you. Any other questions or suggestions? So Leo, this is Nick. I just thought I'd <clears throat> just thought I'd reiter reiterate. Um, I think I heard you say this, but just so everyone knows, you know, we've we filled this out between DC Water and DOE, filled out the colors because we thought it would be easier to start with something rather than a blank slate, but it is by no means. Uh, you know, our, our final version, we really, really, really hope you guys tell us, no, I don't think that's the right color for this one. And here's why um, that we're, you know, I wouldn't think of filling out these colors as the end goal today. We're really hoping this will start the conversation so we can get a little bit deeper into these some ideas, into these ideas. So uh, just, just throw that out there that please don't feel like this is a finished product. We, we do not think of it as a finished product. It's just kind of the beginning of a conversation. Thank you, Nick. Um, this is what you would call a straw man uh, option, only because I don't know what the gender neutral uh, gender neutral version of straw man is, but uh, pardon I'm me close. if it's not politically correct. <laughs> but it's just something for everybody to look at and throw dots at. Or suggestions, helpful suggestions, sorry. Next slide, please. Okay. Philip, would you like to, um, let's go on to the next slide. So, so Lil, the net, we're gonna bring up the actual spreadsheet now and get into that section of the spreadsheet. That's right, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Adria, is it possible to make this larger? Yes, a little too large. Right, let's go to Philip Barlow, would you like to uh, lead us through this? Or would you like me to co-lead it with you? I think you're on the line. So Leo, I'm from uh, Disby as well. Can you can you co-lead it with me? So look, the first thing that pops yeah, out here. is yeah, the first thing that pops out is I see in regards to a community insurance product and a parametric insurance product, there is a difference in the time component. So you know a lot of this is guesswork, but but what were we thinking? When, what were you guys thinking when you filled this out in terms of? You know the time for the community insurance product is 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 less than the time for the parametric. Um, is that based on some historical data you, you were looking at? Could someone briefly explain the difference again, quickly? I think that you can you can generally say that uh, green is good. Orange is bad, yellow is in the middle. Right. Yeah. So if, if, if we take real quickly, so effort, um, roughly green is one agency can do it. Yellow is it's going to take a few agencies. <laughs> Orange is it's going to take a lot of people, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, time, about a year, green, yellow, what, uh, one to five or one to ten, and then no, I think it's one to five. And then orange greater than five years. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I believe the question was also a little explanation of the community insurance product versus a parametric insurance product. I, I can address that. Um, that's based on no real information. <laughs> no, <laughs> no knowledge on what those actually are. So if they are exactly the same and they're both complex, then let's let's change them to be both complex if they are uh, or taking a lot of time if they are the same and can be done in one to five years, then let's let's change that to to that to yellow. Yeah, just to just to throw some thoughts out there. Um, yeah, I think they're complex for different reasons. I think a parametric insurance product that would be a relatively new product that you would buy from a reinsurer. So because it's relatively new, you know, there, there's probably like some time associated with that. Whereas the community insurance product is you know, either something that the district government would create itself. Or, um, yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. Where, and that could be, you know, if, if we're having to create legislation and a program, you know, that could, that could take a lot of time too. So I'll say anything, just, you know, anything, I mean, both whether it's a community insurance product or a parametric insurance product, I mean, those don't exist now. I mean, in the district for this, issue. Uh, I imagine it would take legislation to create um, a framework, at least for parametric insurance, maybe not for a community insurance product, um, but, but possibly for that as well. Uh, and, you know, and then between doing legislation, getting uh, insurers, on board with developing products because we we can't we can't coerce them to develop products even if we create a facility for them to to sell such products. I mean, hopefully there would be a uh, you know there would uh, they would find these ideas reasonable and uh, and potentially you know with an ability to make a profit on them. But uh, but I think anything that involves creating a new kind of insurance that doesn't exist now is is a a sort of a long term kind of uh, uh, project and, a, and an involved project. Okay. So would you say Philip that is a spinning wheels type of uh, uh, you know proposition or is it, it was, we're just we need to change the color. Um, to, to match what, you know, the level of effort looks like. No, I think, I mean, I think they are both, uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't say now that uh, I know that. Either 1 of them is a, uh, is a solution, but I certainly think they are worth investigating. So I, I don't think they're just a spinning wheel thing. I think they, they do. I, I think they have. Transformational value if if we're able to successfully make them happen. So, uh, so, you know, I, I think there's there's a high. Um, there's a high benefit to them and. It, but, but, but it's a big effort. So, you know, I, I so I, I think we ought to pursue them. But, but, but recognizing that it's a big effort. So, Philip, if I could jump in and just give you, a, I'm looking at 1.2.1.1. Um, so, like from the September 10th, 2020 storm, one of the big issues that we were asked to do and our board agreed to was uh, provide a certain amount of service to people who had flooded. Right? The, the question comes in when you do this over time is, how do you create those boundaries as to when you provide the service, who pays for it, et cetera? That's a very needed service because the first 24 hours is where you really want to dry out a home. So if, if people know they have access to some funding to get that done, they can get their work started. 
So that's something that would fall under a parametric insurance product. But like you said, it's it's creating that coalition. Is this one here? Well, to be clear, a parametric insurance product, I mean, you know, typically insurance products um, cover identified losses. Um, so, so first you would have to evaluate the loss and then, uh, and then, you know, pay for the, uh, pay to address the loss. Um, the parametric insurance policies, uh, don't look at the loss. They look at a triggering event. Mm -hmm. And if, if a triggering threshold is met, then a fixed amount of money would be payable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, uh, I mean, there are, there are certainly uh, one, one place where I know parametric insurance is successfully used now is crop insurance, uh, where it pays off if, if rain, if there's not enough rain, for example. Um, and that's easy to measure and that's, and that's straightforward. Uh, you know, where, where it gets complicated is, uh, you know, you have to have a really well designed program so that uh, since you're not looking at losses, you know, you want to make sure that you maximize the uh, likelihood that when there are losses, you've hit the trigger and when there are not losses, you've not hit the trigger. And so, or else you wind up with money and no losses or losses and no money with a parametric insurance product. And so that's, that's, uh, that's a very, that's a very complicated, uh, it's a very complicated thing to, to, to get right. Uh, particularly in, you know, in the smaller the area that you look at, the more difficult that is, that tends to work better when you have, when you're looking at a broader scope than, than for example, an individual home uh, or business. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out, but it can facilitate quicker payments, but only, only if it's set up right so that it's triggered, you know, the, the, you have a lineup between when it's triggered and when there are losses. What would your recommendation be based on your expertise here on some of these uh, color coatings? Um, I, you know, I think that, uh, I think, I mean, for the, for the community and the parametric insurance product, I, I you know, just from looking at them, um, I think things are, things are reasonably good. The one, Except I would change, I would change the time in 1.1 to orange as well because again I think there is, I think it's, it's that's a significant effort. Um, as far as so resilience outcome, I guess maybe it would help me to. I mean, I think if if I think what resilience outcome is is related to whether it whether the um, the category uh, has the potential to reduce the risk of loss I think that's kind of what that is is, is a way to think about it and you know you've got you've got no greens over there for the insurance kind of things, but I think that misses the idea that one of the big one big benefit of insurance is that it can it rewards mitigation. So you know you can you, your insurance will be cheaper if you do things to reduce the likelihood of a loss. So, you know, I, I, so some of these things, I mean, that's a more nebulous kind of thing, but again, if, if you have a community insurance product 
that uh, that looks at what that looks at what the community has done to address resilience and to the extent that you know it's kind of like to take the example fire extinguishers in your home you know you get a discount on your homeowner's insurance if you have fire extinguishers and a fire alarm or smoke alarm you know that kind of stuff so to the extent that insurance pushes uh, through financial incentives um, improvements that uh, that can save that can reduce the risk of loss they're not going to reduce the risk of flooding but they would reduce the risk of loss from flooding which I, I think is so that that's kind of where I guess I wonder about resilience if it's if it's if that should could be expanded to cover um, you know losses rather than just flooding in general. Yeah, I think those are good points, Celeb. I would I would think, yeah, I mean yellow at least. And the other thing I'm thinking about is so yeah, insurance won't prevent your home from getting flooded. But let's say other other action ideas like a levy, right? A levy will prevent your home from getting flooded up to a certain level. And then if the flood is higher than that, it still gets flooded. And then you're still gonna need a small business to dry and clean up your service or insurance to cover the loss that you, you know, they didn't think you were gonna have because of the levy. So I, I think there's I think there's a good argument. Um, so if we go down to 1.3.4, I mean some of this is mixed up, so maybe that talks about um, what can a homeowner do to decrease the loss. Right. You do get flooded. So that would that would then build into a subsidy or a product, either way. Um, yeah, I think um, those are really good points. Um, and defining the benefit and value, you know, has been um, has been a difficult thing as uh, as we've been preparing for this meeting um, to try to figure out how do we define this value. Um, and so I, I I think it's definitely a um, I mean all of these things are important, and it's it's trying to look at this this kind of gradation of what's going to give us more benefit, you know, try to use this as a way to give some clarity to maybe within these different insurance options, you know, what's going to give the better outcome relative to the other insurance options. So that might be a better way to think of it um, for this grouping specifically. Along that line, the Looking at the benefit value scale, it's all expressed in terms of reducing flood risk. And I'm just wondering if it should be flood reducing the risk of flood damage uh, instead, because, um, and I just wanna make sure I understand, is, is there anything on this list, for instance, backup valves that could actually reduce the risk of flooding versus the risk of flood damage? On, so on the list that we're looking at right now, yeah, this is the this is the insurance category. There's other stuff as you go down. No, but I'm look, I'm talking about the benefit value column on the right. When you, when you look at the the actual explanation of of the scale of benefit and resilience outcome, it's it's expressed in high, medium, and low as reduction in flood risk. And I'm asking. If that was the intention, or if it would be more accurate to be reduction in the risk of flood damage, are we are we are we talking about reducing yeah, that, the likelihood of flooding with a backup valve, for example, or just the 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 extent of damage? Yeah, that's that's thanks. That's the same kind of point I was trying to make. You, you know, uh, there's only so much. I mean, from an insurance point of view, there's only so much you can do. I mean, we're not. Having an insurance policy, you know, you can't put the paper up and stop the flood, but uh, but you can, but the insurance can uh, either directly or indirectly 
uh, you know, cause things to be done to uh, to mitigate the risk of loss from a flood. And, I'm not, you know, I'm not even focused on insurance. That. I'm just trying to understand yeah. Yeah. that benefit value resilience category. If you go back to September 2020, if if many more backup valves had been in place, would there have would there have been some homes that avoided flooding or just had less damage? I think so. In that specific example, if every home had a backup valve, mm -hmm. it wouldn't. Uh, the water wouldn't have come from their toilet, but depending on their, you know, the elevation of the door and the elevation of the sidewalk, mm -hmm. you know, water could have come in that way. So it's okay. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky to say. You're bringing up good questions. Um, so there were about 400 homes, 300, 400 homes that would have not flooded and they'd be in a backwater valve. Uh, but there were other homes that would have flooded regardless because it's overland flooding. Yeah. But it's again something that can be mitigated. With so, Lil, I, I um, wonder also if you might bring in the thought of um, maintenance of the backwater valves. I know um, that there was some, or even installation, mm -hmm. that those types of things can right. in, an impact as well. Um, I don't think we have to go into that, but I think uh, what what I'm trying to raise is that there are variables, even when um, you know folks have what they need to be successful. But Saleo, so if I just understood what you said, you said that there would have been 300 to 400 homes in 2020 that would not have flooded if they had backwater valves. Is that what you said, or had would have had less flood damage? Definitely would not have flooded from the sewer. Okay. Some portion of those homes had a dual hit. It flooded from the sewers and also from from the land. Okay. But one is just, I, I mean, they're both not pleasant, but one is water cleanup and the other one is sewage cleanup, which is mm -hmm. a different level of disinfection requirement. Um, but you do bring up an excellent point, and we need to look at this. And maybe the uh, benefit value descriptors don't have to be the same for every one of these categories. What works for one category may not be the same that works for insurance. We may have to define it differently for insurance. Well, it sounds like it's different for backwater valves than everything else, but that's just my first impression. That's a good point. And, and we need to be cognizant of that and not try and use one definition all the way across. But it's still possible to grade it so that we can see if there is a benefit or not. And I think that's a little bit more work, but it's worth it for clarity. So, so Lil, I know that this, this is a really good contribution to the conversation. And I know it's something that we wanna to continue to discuss, but I just wanted to check in with you to see if you wanted to move forward um, so that we can get through the other categories or we can continue on if you find this to be important for the overall discussion. Well, I'd like Philip to take a look at the rest of the action items now or later, uh, both the Philips, and see if you want to have a discussion now where we could have a follow-up call for any of those. Mm -hmm. or, and the same applies to the rest of the team. Because I, I think the first one's always going to take the longest. Um, so Lil, no, I, I, to, oh, I apologize, but I just wanted to hop and say that I think that what you brought up originally about our experience um, paying for uh, remediation and um, some cleaning would be very helpful to Disby and others to understand, um, you know, how these products might be helpful and what we're expecting them to do. Maybe at another date, but definitely would be interesting and I think helpful to understand um, our next steps. And one of the things that's very clear um, is more than the action team meetings, we need some uh, working group meetings to keep working on this. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, add your name in the chat if you'd like to join this week and the rest of the team on this category so we can move on to the next one. 
And Salil, this is Jed Ross. I'm the uh, director of the Office of Risk Management. So just wanted to quickly point out that the Office of Risk Management is the authorized party to buy insurance on behalf of the district. Um, and so Philip was correct in that, you know, for one and two, there's going to be a lot of legislative obligations, but in general, for either one of those, you know, there has to be appropriate authority to buy any types of insurance or to create some type of insurance program to then be administered for the community. Um, so just wanted to make sure that uh, office of risk management, we are the one who buys insurance now for the city. Um, and no other agencies are supposed to actually be able to buy insurance. Just making sure that's clear. And then as it related to 1.3.4, um, I think that that's actually got to be a, a pretty high level of effort if somebody's going to be going out and talking to different homeowners about purchasing and retrofitting um, situations, you know, systems associated with their particular individual homes. And that actually, rather than being green, is going to be definitely a, a yellow category requiring um, a lot of work and effort. Um, so just wanted to make sure I pointed those couple things out. Um, we have definitely talked at the office risk management over a couple of years. We've talked in, uh, to people in different marketplaces about a community insurance program. Um, we currently administer a captive insurance program for the district, very small. Um, which would be tackling 1.1 1 .1. um, as it relates to 1.2. If we were to buy a, a, um, a parametric policy, we would have to have some really tight guidelines around that. And we'd also have to have some really tight, um, whether it be regulations and or statutory obligations, you know, defining how would those monies be dispersed. And then, of course, very specific authority about how that would happen, how people would apply and how it would be issued. Something that I know that DOE deals with all the time, um, but how do you actually administer a program where you where you pay out proceeds? Generally, when the District of Columbia receives proceeds from an insurance policy, it goes to the general fund. So a special fund would have to be created and there would have to be very strict rules about how those funds would be dispersed and the application processes and, and what have you. Um, around that, so just wanted to make sure that those were kind of known. The same would also, of course, be around a community insurance product um, in terms of uh, whether we became the captive insurance agency or an insurance pool for the community um, and they were able to have heavily subsidized insurance that they then bought into our program. We would have a captive pool and we would then disturb disperse funds when certain metrics were met, establishing that those policies would be paid out. So just wanted to kind of put out, you know, those those thoughts um, and make sure that we were um, a part of the conversation and that it was kind of known that if insurance was being bought, generally it's either the mayor or the Office of Risk Management who buys insurance on behalf of the city. And I think it would also be kind of a conflict of interest if Disby were buying insurance clearly as the regulators. So just wanted to make sure that was pointed out and appreciate everyone's uh, effort and thoughts on all of this. No, I do appreciate so, this is critical. So, yes, so we certainly would not be buying insurance. Um, I, you know, I, I think there, and, and I think all those are very valid points. If we, and, and I think in some instances, we probably would go the way of the district being the entity that purchases this insurance. But, you know, a parametric insurance and community insurance products could also be uh, privately purchased by homeowners so or businesses or whatever. So um, in, in that case, then, and, and that's frankly, because, you know, that's what we deal with is commercial insurance is, is, not, is not so much the, less on the government purchased insurance. So. Um, I think that we need to keep in mind that that's also a potential option for a way to uh, to have this insurance come into effect. It's a great discussion. And I do think it warrants continuation even after this meeting. So I'll set something up. If you'd like to be part of it, Jen, I'm going to hope that you would be. Um, just add your name to the chat, please. Monty, you want to, or Adria, you want to go on to the next one? Next category, if you're ready. 
switching now. Thank you. I think we can do two, three, and four in one uh, visual. Fantastic. Thank you. That's good. So category two, repair to flood damage for Amicia. Are you on that one? Yes, I am. Hi there, Salil. Hi, everyone. Um, so from my initial review of the information on the screen and the like the project scoping metrics that you guys have laid out, um, based on some of the projects and programs that are that are existing in the district, um, they are um, one agency efforts. But I think that this level, this particular category, would require multiple agencies. Um, that was something that came to mind. And another thing that came to mind that I was just wanting to get more clarity on was the benefit, the scale of benefit that you guys have um, laid out. It looks as though, and correct me if I'm um, understanding this um, and open up to the floor for, I'm just able to f facilitate, but um, the, this is really geared towards map, the mapped area, the FEMA mapped area, the 100, 500 year floodplain. Um, and so that's what I was gathering from the, um, the visual, but if I'm mistaken, please let me know. Um, the reason I wonder that is because of uh, flooding that was experienced, if we take the example uh, from uh, September 10th, and we take in the examples from a lot of the calls and, com and concerns that residents were bringing forth, they were of the neighborhoods, I believe it was four to six neighborhoods of those one neighborhood was in the designated floodplain. Yeah, I think the Meredith you know, mentioned that trying to come up with uh, these different scales was pretty hard and we, we were kind of going back and forth between how to categorize the scale of benefit. I mean, it's a good point. Yeah, I think especially with the interior flooding. A lot of that's outside of the 100 and 500 year floodplains. So, but that's not to say that there aren't a lot of homes that would be affected. So, um, we're, I'm taking notes on that. Yeah, I would just say with this category, just the scope of uh, um, when we say a program to fund and repair. Uh, Low income homes after a flood. Um, I, I think that was something I had asked, had um, was initial question um, from our last meeting. Just understanding that um, um, as I look more uh, a better understanding of September 10th, which I think is a great example to kind of overlay over what we're trying to propose. There were six neighborhoods, and of the six neighborhoods, uh, one was. Uh, um, um, LaJoy Park, which um, we are familiar with with 2012, but then there was uh, Deanwood, which I, I, I'm assuming they meant to mean Watts Branch area. Um, that's where they had a lot of resources for residents. Um, so those are things that are important to know, but of those, those were the only two. The other four were areas that are new to our understanding uh, which is uh, Michigan Park, um, Brooklyn, Ivy, IE City, Trinidad area. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind about this, the, the scope of the program. Um, but there are resources currently, but there needs to be more. Yeah, I, I want to add that looking at this more and, and and hearing the discussion today, I think what we're missing here is um, in the resilience outcome, you know, we've got, we're trying to target, is it somebody, is it protecting, is it, is it reducing that flood risk or um, to that resident and, and, and how much, but I think we've, the flood task force specifically calls out reducing risk for vulnerable residents and vulnerable areas. And so I think we need to 
acknowledge that as um, in, in our ratings here um, or in our evaluation so that that itself gets higher weight. Um, you know, if we are in fact accomplishing that, we, we need to, to show because that is a high value of this task force. I just wanted to interrupt. There are two, there are a couple of things in the chat that, I, that had not been discussed. Um, we had a, a note from, from Grace Soderberg that um, what will be the sources for the funding uh, for these proposed products? And that, that goes back to the previous conversation. And I just wanted to acknowledge that one before we move too far along. Um, so if someone wanted to answer that, and then there's um, a couple of comments by, um, by Mr. Ross that were brought up in the chat as well. I'll, I'll say them after the first question's answered. Yeah, I think, well, I think Jed actually kind of got it exactly right. And I think as a group and in, in this group right here, we can brainstorm what the possible funding sources might be. And, but ultimately we're looking to the task force to, um, you know, if it needs to come out of the city budget to, you know, be lending some support toward that action, or like go in with eyes wide open that like, yep, we think this is important. We know it has to come from the city budget. And then when we're making the city budget, you know, uh, support that action being in there. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if that helps answer, answer your question, but I think Jed had it right. Nick, I, I, one more comment on that. I think it really will depend on what types of um, what types of these different categories are we tackling. So, if we're talking about a community insurance product, which doesn't exist in the marketplace at all, is not really being done by any governments, um, it's basically creating an insurance pool where the government will create some types of subsidized insurance policy where individuals can come low and low and um, low and moderate income individuals for their homeowners can come to the district you know pay a heavily subsidized insurance uh, premium to the district we create a captive or some type of pool it's backed by at least an initial large amount of funding in order to buy that policy um, in the open marketplace or we just create our own policy, our all our own program, and then we go to the reinsurance marketplace to kind of tackle um, uh, uh, the the upper layers of of what we might not want to cover, um, and basically we would get some some seed funding uh, from from the overall annual budget of the District of Columbia, um, or we get some grants from some third parties for that seed funding and maybe we're able to collect enough premiums even if it's low you know they're they're subsidized that we can continue on an annual basis so long as we don't have any major losses and subject to major losses then we're going to be looking back to the district to refund a future that program in the future so it's just a matter of um, figuring that out there's a lot of um, there's a lot of push and pull. So if you make, if we made that decision, if we made that recommendation, we wanted to go through that effort, both legislatively, through regulations, through process and applications, um, and establishing what our payout requirements would be if people buy into those policies, what's our outreach to get people to participate in that pool, that program, that community, community insurance program, you know, whether we're gonna be funding it to the nth degree, meaning we don't necessarily need those subsidized dollars from premiums from those homeowners. We just are going to buy the policy when the issue, when the bad loss occurs, they apply and we pay for it. If they were within certain boundary lines, you know, all of those decisions need to be made in order to establish whether we're talking about, you know, a couple million dollars of seed money to buy a, 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 a policy in the marketplace or whether we're doing our own captive and then we're buying reinsurance or we're not doing any of that and we're going to fully fund it. You know, so all of those decisions need to be made. And then from there, we're going to be able to make recommendations about how we fund that, whether it's going to take, you know, $20 million or whether it's going to be 
$3 million of seed money, and hopefully those premiums, even though subsidized over years, we can get them into a position where hopefully if we don't have a major loss, the, the program will self fund. And even when we do have a loss in 3 or 4 years and lots of people um, looking for for those policies to be paid upon. We'll still be able to then do a renewal of the program in the next year again. All of those things are kind of. Determining factors that have to be analyzed same for parametric, you know, are we buying a policy? And as Philip said, you know, is this something that private residents are going to be doing and buying on their own and the government's not doing it? Well, you know, as it is, we can't get people to buy low, low and moderate income uh, homeowners in the district aren't buying flood insurance and in flood prone areas at high volumes and why we're having these these consistent problems. So the idea of then trying to convince them to do parametric purchases seems pretty far fetched if they're not even buying regular flood insurance. So it's just all of those kind of decisions about the, the cost benefits and what we should be pursuing, what we shouldn't be pursuing, and then what would be the cost to have the best program given the, you know, the best program for a community insurance program, I can tell you is let's fully fund it. Let's get 50 million dollars. The district taxpayers are going to pay for that. We're going to go by reinsurance. We're going to get people engaged. We're going to do these steps to try and educate them and mitigate things, but we'll have a district flood insurance program for the community in particular areas that when they have a loss, the district comes forward and just does it and the taxpayers are paying for that. But is that reasonable? Is that appropriate? Is it the right thing for us to do? Is it worth our effort? Is it worth our energy? Is that the best value to the taxpayers as a whole? And all of those decisions and discussions kind of really need to take place. So then we can get to thinking about what funding makes sense. Um, I know that that it's it's a chicken and egg and a cart and horse conversation, but I think that that is you know really getting to what we're doing here is great in terms of analyzing cost benefit and then in each of these categories there will have to be specific funding conversations for the best cost benefit analysis about how that category should move forward and then making the recommendation on funding as a result of that just my two cents and sorry to go on so long but just wanted to kind of highlight and, and kind of lay that out i think progressively for for all of our planning perspectively one other question related to that, and, and I may be forgetting, but my recollection is that um, DDOE would, would be getting funding to complete analysis of which areas in the district are most likely to flood. Is that correct? So if, if that's the case, I'm just wondering how that figures into everything Mr. Ross has described about insurance. Yeah. Um, so you're right that you know we're getting close to being able to award a contract which will help us map out the areas that are at risk of you know interior flooding, you know, like the like what happened in September 10th. So if if is that is it an insurance program just for everybody wherever they are in the city, or would it matter if they fell into a zone that is more or less likely to flood? I think it would, so it does matter in terms of setting the premium price or like, or the willingness of a reinsurer, right? Because if you're saying we just want, we just want insurance for all district residents, some of them don't really have flood risks, some of them do, that's a different premium than, hey, we want insurance for these people we know have flood risk, you know, there's like a, there's a certain likelihood that they'll, they'll be flooded. So this is getting, this is getting, you know, beyond my capacity to like understand insurance premiums, but like I, there is a relationship that, you know, I think we can both, if we do it ourselves as a government, or if we are asking, you know, a reinsurer, I think giving them the data so that instead of guessing and over guessing the premium, they can, they can have the like, the best available data to set their rates. Definitely, that's 
definitely that's accurate in terms of, you know, if somebody has a higher risk of it, the premium theoretically should be more. But as we're tackling, as we're tackling, I think some of these decisions that the task force needs to decide upon is, is it best for us to tackle particular geographic areas? Is it best for us to say this is a wider program? Um, so I think those are just policy conversations that will have to be made and ultimate decisions and recommendations from the task force will be put forward. It's fantastic that DOEE is doing the analysis because as we know, the 100 and 500 year um, planes that have been identified by FEMA don't really take care of a lot of the issues that we've been seeing as a city for, you know, whether it's Rivarian, rain, you name it, whatever the particular circumstances that we've been encountering aren't just the tidal basin flooding. And so um, getting that up those updated floodplains and updated flood information will help us help to inform a lot of that decision making. Hey, as we um as we get back to to looking at the these different categories and ratings, um, I just want to add it. You, you noticed on the uh, on category one under insurance how we had added a lot of sub actions and detail, and um, on category two and three we don't have that level of detail. So I think it's this is a good time to be thinking about are there more items that should be going into these other categories? Are there more actions we should be looking at? Um, so just think about that, and as we, um, you know, as we continue talking about this, and um, and you go home and look at it, or <laughs> go home, uh, think over the next couple of weeks, you know, before our, our meeting, next meetings of what we do with this. Um, think if there are other items we need to fill in here. I have I a guess. recommendation on category two. Um, I know that people, once we give a program to fund uh, repair to low income homes after floods, there should be a support system around DCRA um, from a permitting perspective associated with that. So just because we fund it doesn't necessarily mean we're making it easy for those repairs to happen. So that might be whether that in category three or category two, um, just the everywhere here, the DCRA, I see it um, in number four. But I think it's probably important for us to have some type of permitting um, process to help support homeowners, low and moderate income homeowners to uh, be able to actually go through the permitting process to make those repairs. That's a good suggestion. And for me, see, I don't know if, I mean, do you have any sense of how, all right, maybe DC Water too, I mean, you know, I, I know DC Water for the for the cleanup. Um, you, know, you just gave money. You just gave cash, and they were on their own to find the contractor. Is that right? No. So we had a cleanup contractors, two cleanup contractors on contract with fixed dollar amounts, and what we found out is, in, in a lot of homes, it was adequate. But some homes with a lot of furniture, rugs, et cetera, in the basement, that dollar amount did not completely finish the job. So part of this connection is, you know, it's all interconnected, all of these four, is uh, if we are going to provide, not we, but the bigger picture, the city is going to provide any money, there should also be some education on how do you mitigate or minimize damage in case you get flooded. So that the money that you get is going to be adequate. If you completely finish your basement and you have no protections and you get flooded, your damage is going to be significantly higher. And I can just add to that. Hi, I'm Steve Dudek from the Office of People's Council um, okay. because we worked with DC Water after the September 10th flooding and got a lot of complaints, probably around 20 to 30. And there was different types of cases where People had um, thirty thousand dollars in damages uh, after the the restoration costs, and a lot of it came down to being informed, uh, knowing what the services were provided, because DC Water, on their own goodwill, initiated that program to provide some help. They didn't have to do that, and I think the public got caught up on um, that everything would have been reimbursed for them. And so that was a lot of our conversations with those consumers that the $5,000 was just for restoration. 
And so I think uh, outreach is important. Education is important to one manage expect expectations, but to empower the consumer to say, hey, due to climate change, we know flooding in the district will continue to be a problem. And this is how we can help. These are the agencies that can assist you. And if you have any general questions, feel free to reach out to those agencies. Yeah, these are these are super helpful. So, Lil, I'm Nick, I'm Art, I'm Meredith. I'm taking those notes, and I can send back um, some of additional actions that people have shared, and potentially some other suggestions. Um, but I think I think, like you said, these are connected. Um, understanding the insurance um, product that is potentially will be available. Um, Will be helpful, but then also understanding what residents, the priority prioritization of the repairs and where that would happen. Um, just understanding that from the group um, that would be helpful, but I definitely will send back some of the suggestions and hopefully you guys can add more. Thank you. I just wanted to look at the 4.1.1 and just mention that. The design community, the professionals, uh, engineers, architects, um, builders, they, they really need to be uh, tapped in terms of uh, identifying their, their options. Um, a lot of design professionals are working for a homeowner and the homeowner is telling them because they're paying to do X. And whatever X is may be counter to what the mission is of this task force because you know that individual that wants that basement doesn't want to hear that they have to relocate all of their mechanical equipment, plumbing equipment, and, or, or lose the basement altogether. Um, education, information, and getting the design professional at the stage of design prior to permitting, prior to uh, uh, inspection, or any, any other type of enforcement is, is where we really need to focus. And, and that could change a lot of those yellows to green um, because getting the design professionals, the uh, d developers and the GCs uh, on board with, uh, with our mission can, can preempt a lot of this and, and not have the burden be on the agency. And it's, it's unfortunate that uh, DCRA has to come in and say, no, you can't do that <laughs> because um, they, they reside in a flood uh, hazard area or floodplain uh, prone area. Um, but uh, design professionals that are meeting with months in advance should be looked at as a um, uh, as a source. Uh, that, that just goes with the education and the getting the outreach. That's all that is. So. That's an excellent point. A lot, a lot of these were based on uh, your comments from the last meeting. I would do appreciate that. It's very helpful. Um, Four point one point two. We just jump to that one for now. Um, again, that talks about how do we require a backwater valve if someone rents out a basement dwelling? And if it's a rental unit, the renter doesn't know, may not know a whole lot about protections from a backwater system, but the code. Basically, you should say that if you're below the upstream manhole, you should have a backwater valve. It's just good protection. Um, what what kind of coalition would we need for that one or the next one or the next one below that to be? So I, I can actually uh, uh, discuss that. Uh, sure. So yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the CCCB. I brought this up before where uh, any changes uh, to uh, regulations uh, in the district uh, for uh, DCMR 12, which is the district municipal regulations, has to go through that uh, body. Uh, that body is appointed by the mayor. Uh, I happen to be a board member uh, of that. And they do have technical advisory groups that are available for any and all for the public, for the government to sit in and address some of these concerns. Uh, but that, unfortunately for now, I can only speak for DCMR 12. I, I, I do not know if there is a similar body for uh, DCMR 20, 
which is the DOEE regulations. Uh, but uh, that 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 could be you know uh, that could be uh, confirmed or looked up. But uh, for for any type of code change, it will have to go through that body. Now, be very mindful. Uh, a code change is different from a process and policy. Um, the director of DCRA is the code official. Uh, he then um, appoints a code a, a chief building official uh, that uh, takes on the responsibility of you know, enforcing the code. But we do have administrative authority to interpret as well as identify policies and practices that would benefit uh, the district. So that there's some gray area there. Um, and, and if we could discuss exactly which backwater valve kind of portion uh, in the plumbing codes that would sort of be in line with what's already in the code, but be a betterment for the city, that's how we need to, to work in that direction uh, in order so that we don't have to go through a very lengthy process of trying to modify the uh, building code slash plumbing codes. Thank you. Very helpful. And I think we've had this discussion before, like 4.1.4. When it ties back to the insurance, would there be a subsidy from an insurance rate perspective for sewer backup insurance if you had a backwater valve? Uh, the discussion item, because that could then entice people to put one in. Yeah, I would expand it. I mean, not just backwater valve, but if they've done other flood flood proofing. There you go. We, we jump category three for the. Monty, do we have time to cover that? I just typed in the chat. We have about two minutes remaining, but you, you know, we can always uh, shave a little bit off the end if you want to round five. Nick, you can so, yeah. just to cover. Category yeah, I, so, you know, I'm just hearing this conversation and all of these are at some point dependent on funding, right? If we're going to repair, we're going to repair homes, we need funding. If we're going to flood proof homes, we need funding. Because the whole idea is that we're, we're trying to make the flood proofing and the repair and the insurance easier. And I wonder if we can knock out all of these, we can provide that funding source with some kind of like global parametric policy that pays the district. And then the district is just there saying like, okay, who needs a backwater valve? You need one. Here's some money. Who needs flood proofing? Who needs repair? Like, I don't know. I'm oversimplifying it, but maybe they I mean, they're so in interconnected. Um, and you know, just maybe just to spend a second on the on what category three is. So category two is like your house has flooded. You have water damage in it. You need you need someone in there quick to dry it out, cut out the drywall. Category three, that's before the flood, your home is at risk. You know, is, can we elevate your utilities? Can we do some other flood proofing around your house so that the next time it does flood, either uh, you're you're protected at, at a building scale. Um, so, yeah, I, th I, th I think we just leave it. We can leave it at that. I don't know if any if anyone has thoughts on um, the effort and the effort value. Yeah, so um, there is some connection. I, I think there's some of the items that are under the insurance section that were very much related to the flood smart home retrofits. So, um, you know, the, you're, you're absolutely right, Nick. There is a heavy dependency between all of these items. And I think as we're just as we're going through um, how we're actually going to accomplish these things and creating the action plans, we can kind of group those right things together and and then reference the other other parts. So.
Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Nick. Monty, do you want to take us? Great. So we'll transition to uh, thank you for the conversation, everyone. It sounds like there's a lot of notes in areas that we need to um, make some adjustments. It sounds like from Misia, you're going to um, give your feedback in some notes post meeting, which we highly appreciate. Um, and Jed, thank you so much for your contribution to the conversation. That was really enlightening um, to hear kind of the process and your thought of what it would take to have um, these type of, you know, there's no example of it right now because there, there, there is none and what the possibility looks like. So thank you for that. Um, Chris, you sound very engaged with the community that we were having kind of some question marks on. So I think that having your voice um, amplified in that space, on, in, especially in section four, uh, category four, excuse me, would be very helpful. So your outtake notes on that would be valuable. Um, and then, so generally, you've brought up a great point, which is that flood risk versus flood damage. And we really appreciate that, that kind of back to point one or square one and thinking to kind of overlay everything that we're doing and distinguishing the two. Um, we have some of that distinguishment here, but I think that it takes a further refinement um, that will um, help make this, this plan um, speak to the concerns of this of this action team. So this has been great. Um, we're going to transition over to closing out our meeting. So um, if if uh, with that, Meredith, could you come online to talk about um, what we're looking at, looking forward to doing with our January nineteenth uh, full task force meeting? Thank you. Yes. Um, next slide. Yeah. So so what we want to do um, for the action team meeting? Excuse me. Flood Task Force meeting next week is um, take what we've talked about today and these um, the overview of all the categories and action um, ideas and present that to um, to the task force. So as we were talking, I think um, I'm going to co combine a little bit of the homework here. Um, I think what would be a great idea is if. Um, the category leads work with the members of their action category to modify um, the chart that we've created to get it to a point where everyone's content with it, you know, in terms of taking it to the next step. Um, and so we will present that to the task force, give the opportunity to get feedback from, from the task force. You know, we have many of the agency directors there to, um, to give us that feedback. So. So that's what we what we want to what we want to do, and also related to um, the public listening sessions, we want to get to you know having the evaluation of all these actions, getting to the matrix that Salil presented um, at the beginning, the the effort value um, matrix, so that when we go to the public, we can share with them you know what we're thinking about. The ideas we have and kind of where they fall on that spectrum of, um, of effort to value. Um, another item that we want to bring up at the, the task force meeting is if anybody in any agency is working on something right now, say a grant application or a budget enhancement request, and you need task force support to back that up, um, we want to take the opportunity when the task force is meeting to, to gain that support. So, um, so let us know if you do have anything um, that's out there. I know from DOE, we have a budget enhancement request for Flood Smart Homes uh, proposal to, um, to fund um, an initial set of work, or actually multiple years of work to, to implement Flood Smart Homes. Um, I think I'll, I'll turn it over now to Opera, who will talk about the public listening sessions. Good afternoon, everyone. This has been a great discussion and quickly, we just want to review and for the edification as you guys are, as we all continue to kind of talk to, or excuse me, talk through and walk through kind of the outcomes of what we want to come from this task force. There is a human um, and community component that is also leading this effort um, that I believe actually Meredith spoke to quite eloquently when talking about how we are um, thinking about our outcomes and the effort. 
um, of any of results and the actions that we propose. And so in a parallel discussion of what we're actually doing um, with the task force, we also need to be hearing from and talking with the community. I think that there were excellent questions that were brought up in the beginning in regards to overlaying, for example, what happened on September 10th or the September 10th flood event with some of these proposed actions. And so maybe that's some considerations also that we can take um, as we reach out and have community conversations in regards to one, what the public um, actually needs and is understanding as it relates to all flood, flood risk um, and flood concerns here in the district. So the thought is that we want to host at least three public um, outreach listening sessions all before, um, I believe, the mid-March. Um, and they will be hosted at different times of the day to um, hopefully encourage as the most participation as possible. So there'll be a morning and afternoon and evening sessions. And we are also hoping to gather intel from um, all representative quadrants of the city as well. And really the main focus is to initially go through this exercise with the community that we're doing now, as far as kind of outlaying some actions that we think as a task force um, would be um, of the advantage for this task force to come up with, but that is only advantageous as what the community needs and the resources that they need to be resilient and sustainable um, in, in this climate and flood conversation. So more to come on that. We would definitely appreciate any insights um, into the public um, listening sessions. Also, your attendance once we have the confirmed dates um, would be welcomed as well. We will also, I think I should add the caveat that most of these, actually all of these right now, our current posture is to have these virtually. Um, but hopefully that also will encourage um, the participation of the community as well. And I believe that's it for this slide. Great, so Meredith, it sounds like you already gave the homework unless you have a little bit more to add to that. Um, yeah, let's um, let's show the, the slide to make sure I probably missed something here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in in regards to the, um, the action plan ideas, um, we wanna make sure we've captured um, any ideas that should be added. And also, we're going to add on to this, as I mentioned, that um, we want all the, the action category leads to coordinate to come up with the final version of, um, of the evaluation color ratings. We will modify that last um, section that we had a lot of discussion about um, the community value um, to help help try to um, to give that a, a better better definition um, to really show how, how that would be valued um, before we do that. But in terms of dates, we've written on here January 28th. Um, what we actually wanna do is before the next task force meeting, which is a week from tomorrow, that's when we wanna have all the category, um, the action evaluations done. This is for additional information to add on top of that. So if there's ideas, we can add those now. If you want to add them now, get them in front of the task force by next week, add them in now. Um, otherwise, they can always be added in later. Um, we also want to make sure we've got any relevant reports and our agency efforts. Um, we sent out a collaboration document before, well, actually right after the, the new year last week. Um, with a link to add information to that. Um, and as we move towards the next action team meetings, we want to start identifying uh, what agencies will be the leads on these actions. So um, let's plan to come to the next action team meeting um, with an idea of who's gonna be the leads. And we will start uh, delegating and, and hopefully lots of volunteering will happen and it will just all work out. And if you want to do uh, participation in an action category that you're not currently on the list for, um, talk to the category lead to get added to that. So I think that covers it all. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, thank you to the DC Water and DOEE team. This has been great. The time and effort that put that's put into 
taking on the task force work and presenting it to the action teams is um, quite a bit. So um, I guess it's a labor of love, though. Everybody's really into it, and we're happy to be collaborating with each other. Um, but please, as action team members, we, again, encourage you to participate offline. You have a, quite a bit of homework. Not, not Nothing is too heavy, but, uh, but it should be something that should come fairly uh, natural because it's the cadence of what you're doing on a daily basis. So hopefully you all will, will be able to convene offline. Um, again, uh, Salil and Opera from DC Water are your points of contact for this uh, flood task force, as well as Meredith and, and Nick. Um, if you have any questions, um, they're available. And uh, with that, I'd like to say um, there are a few meetings coming up. We have our governance and coordination action team meetings uh, meeting on January 14th, which is a few days from now, and that's at 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, again, there'll be a WebEx link that will go out. Our full task force meeting will be on January 19th from 2 to 4 p.m., um, another WebEx meeting. Um, we will be reporting out from our action team activity from this month um, at that particular meeting, as we've discussed. And then um, the next residential resilience action team meeting is in February on February 8th um, from 2.30 to 4 p.m. So. With that, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, this meeting is adjourned, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Hello. Great. Well done. Thank you. Hello. Who's calling? Hello.